Hey, what's going on guys? My name is Griffin and I'm a filmmaker based out of Orange County, California. And today we're going to go behind the scenes of an interview setup. So come on, take it with me. So today our cameras, the A camera is the C500 Mark II and we're using the Kawa Promenar lenses. And our B camera is the C70 and our C camera is the C70 as well. Usually when I'm doing an interview, the way I like to position the lights in relation to the subject is I'll place the light and then I'll place the subject where they look with their eye line. And then I place the A camera and the B camera. Now usually if you can, it's best to use at least two cameras. Now part of the reason for that is you can cut between your A camera and your B camera. So if someone's saying something and then um, they kind of get lost for a second, but then they pick it back up and they start talking again, it allows you to cut, to cut out the um and the ah uh and things like that where they sort of have a momentary fumble. And you can cut from A camera to B camera in the edit where it just kind of looks seamless for the viewer and you don't necessarily have to do hard cut or alternatively show where they're having a moment where they sort of can't think of what they wanted to say. I'll put the A camera and the B camera both where they're shooting on the shadow side of the face and I'll usually make them at least two focal lengths apart. So for example, on my A camera, maybe I have a 35. On my B camera, assuming it's the same sensor size, I'll usually have an 85. Or if on my A camera, I have a 50. On my B camera, usually I'll have 100. I don't usually like to use two focal lengths that are right next to each other, like a 50 and a 75 or something like that, because it almost looks like it might be similar framing. And then the last thing I would say in relation for the placement of the A camera and B camera, I'll usually put the A camera a little closer and wider. Our B camera comes around on a little bit of a different angle. So it's filming just a little bit of a, like more of a sidey profile look. And then if you have a C camera like we do today, and this one is actually really profile. So it's shooting more, I'll, I'll put a clip here of what that actually looks like, but it's shooting where it's much more sidey. So one thing that I learned, I actually learned this, I think I learned this one from Dave, but movement cuts well with movement. So today, this camera happens to be on a slider. So what's gonna be happening is Dave will be operating this one and he's kind of moving it left to right. He gets here, slows down nice and steady, right to left. So it's a really nice look. This is a sort of a medium wide shot. Your B and your C camera, if they're also moving a little bit too, it's gonna to make it just feel a little more natural when you cut from the A to camera to the B camera. And then the tip that I got from Dave actually was doing what's called a loose head tripod. You want to talk about this one? So you've got two slider cameras, both of them moving. So then you've got your third one on sticks here. Basically what I try to do is I try to keep this in constant movement at about the same speed as what the sliders are doing. That way when we cut from a slider shot back to the tripod shot, the view is not jarred so much that they're like, oh, what's going on? You cut from movement to movement and it feels nice and fluid. One tip I have is anytime you're shooting in a scene with windows is you kind of want to light from the same direction as the window. So even with the window light, it's actually not a bad looking setup. You can see the light on his face. It's kind of wrapping across the face right here, but it does look a little bit, um, you could say a little too contrasty there, and the light doesn't exactly wrap all the way across his face. But I do like shooting into the corner because you're getting these sort of leading lines here, right here, and you also have sort of built-in contrast to your shot. You have light, you have dark, you have light, you have dark sort of repeating patterns. But one thing I would want to do is wrap the light across the face a little more. So what I'll do is I'll turn the light on, striking. There we go. And now it sort of looks like pretty natural, you could say. So that's one thing to think about. If you're lighting with windows in your shot, you want to light from the same direction. You don't exactly want to just, when I originally started shooting interviews, I would think, okay, well, we need to even that out. You don't want shadows on the face. That's totally unprofessional looking. But it turns out it actually is professional. So I used to want to flood light in from this side to kind of even it out. But what you can do instead of trying to kill all the shadows is you just kind of wrap the light a little more across the face. So you can still see their face, but you get sort of a nice wrap across the face and you get kind of like a little Rembrandt lighting right here, which all Rembrandt lighting means is it's just like a little triangle on the cheek. So that's a little tip for interview lighting when you have windows in the shots. I'm here with Tyler Edwards. I'll link his YouTube channel down below. Tyler was uh, one of the guys that was sort of an inspiration for me when I was actually starting YouTube. And now today he's working with me on set. So that's super cool. Yeah. But Tyler's gonna give a little tip on using soft lighting for interviews. Yeah, so like Griff said, my name's Tyler Edwards. And I'm so stoked to be on set again. This is our yeah. second, second, second time, time yeah. on set. 
So yeah, soft light is really important for uh, for key light. The reason why it's soft light is a couple things. Is it really softens blemishes and kind of hides blemishes on skin tones. So it just makes everything look a little bit more pleasing. And with hard with hard light, it just you get really nasty shadows and it it ends up typically looking a little bit more stylistic. The main point is soft light for key lights is really important, and that's kind of that's kind of what you want to go to first of all for your interviews just because of how natural it looks and how pleasing it looks on pretty much every skin tone out there. Sweet. So our actual lighting setup today is we have an Aperture 600D and we have just this $100 softbox off Amazon, but it's a 60 inch Octabox. And one of the things you want to do with the soft light, any light can basically be soft or hard depending on how far or close it is from your subject. So generally speaking, if you do want to have soft light where it looks nice on your face, so if I'm looking right here, you're going to notice nice soft wrapping light on my face and a nice shadow side on this, this side here. The way you get that is you get the light nice and in close. And generally speaking, what I'll do is I'll walk the light in as close as possible where it's actually in the shot. And then I'll ask someone to stand behind the camera and I'll say, let me know when that light's just out. And I'll scoot the light out one inch at a time. And as soon as it's out of frame, then you know, boom, that's as close as you can get your light. That way you can have a nice soft light. The closer your light's gonna be, and the bigger your light's gonna be, the softer it'll be on the face. And generally speaking, smooths things out just like Ty was saying, and it'll make you look a little better. So one of the really important things when you're filming an interview is you wanna make sure you have really good audio. So what I like to do when I walk into a room is you can clap, I'm not gonna do it because it'll be really loud. But you clap and you can notice if there's an echo in the room or not. Typically if there's like wood floors or something like that, you're gonna have a bit of an echo. So one thing you can do to kind of combat the echo is you can use sound blankets. These sound blankets are actually really cool because they're white on one side, they're black on the other. So you can use them as either a fill or as negative fill. And today we're using this fill because it's pretty contrasty. So it sort of gets rid of some of that echo. And at the same time, it acts as a little bit of fill and helps fill in some of the shadows on the shadow side of the face. So in terms of audio, another thing I like to do is a best practice is to run two sources of audio. So a lot of times you can run what Dave's doing right here is a lavalier mic. And so that lavalier mic would either clip on to like the shirt right here, or alternatively what you might do if you have a nice small lav like this. So yeah, all you would do, this is a bit more of a professional look as you take the lav and take this thing, and you kind of just sandwich it in between, just like that. And then you take the little, there's a different version. So this one's, it's like a little furry dead cat basically, but there's also other versions that are just felt. Each of them work just fine. You kind of sandwich this around. And then what you do, once you have your talon, you can peel this and you can apply it. The best spot for the lab is kind of right between the chest line right here, right center chest. You don't want it right here. A lot of people put it right here. You get a really throaty sound. It doesn't sound very natural. If you actually put it right here, kind of right center chest, it's gonna have a little bit more of a full natural sound. Sometimes with female talent, what I would suggest doing is you can just ask them and, and suggest, hey, go ahead and put it center chest and apply it to yourself because you don't want to be like a creepy weirdo. Use the mic clip on their bra strap as well. That and actually works really well as well. Which are we doing that one today? Probably do that. Cool, let's do that one today. So another little tip for audio. Uh, the other way, we talked about the lavalier mic. The other way is what's called a shotgun mic typically. So the key thing with the shotgun you know, whatever one you have is, is probably okay. The biggest thing is mic placement. You wanna, I, I heard this, I don't know, from Curtis Judd or somewhere online, but you kind of take your finger and go like that, and that's kind of the distance. If you can get in that distance, that's like the real sweet spot. So I think 12 to 18 inches is generally considered best placement. And you don't necessarily wanna aim it directly at their mouth. What I like to do is actually aim it just in front of their mouth. If I set it for right here, it's kind of aimed right at Dave's mouth, which is great. And then if Dave sort of does one of these things, now he's gonna be off axis from the mic and it's not, it's gonna be picking up the top of his head. It's gonna sound really weird. So what I like to do is I'll aim it kind of at like their chest. So it's just, it gives a little bit of breathing room. So you can actually scoot it just a little bit forward. That way we're still right at about 18 inches, but if he leans forward, he leans back, it's still gonna be pretty good either way around. And then that combined with the lav, Usually you use one or the other. That was another thing I figured out. When I was first starting, I was like, oh, like, why does it sound so weird if like, both of these, like the lab and the shotgun at the same time? But if you just, usually you'll pick whichever one sounds better, which 
Most cases, it's going to be the shotgun, as long as you get it nice and close to your subject. But the lab is always a great backup if it, for whatever reason, wasn't close to your subject. So funny story, the first time I met Dave, I was actually filming a Hillsong United concert at Staples Center. And Dave was working with Hillsong United. And I had rented some Kawa anamorphic lenses. I've shot on these lenses a bunch now. And I also rented an Alexa Mini, which it's a, it's a pretty sick setup, to be honest. But I had never shot with anamorphic lenses myself. So most people know that anamorphic lenses have those horizontal flares. One thing that threw me off is when I got it, I was trying to put the lens. And keep in mind, I didn't go to film school or anything like that. I thought, OK, well, if it's horizontal flares, it only makes sense that the lens would be horizontal like this. Well, it turns out that's not how you put anamorphic lenses on. I quickly figured that out. But one thing I'll usually do is I'll look for what looks like the top of the lens. And it's, it's a little different on every lens. But there's usually writing on the top that indicates where to go. There's a little notch right there. All you need to do, if it's an anamorphic lens, you put it so it's vertical. And you line that little notch up with this little one notch right here on your PL mount. You line them up. And you got to kind of just wiggle it a little bit. Once it's in, you press against. Close the PL mount before you let go. You just kind of want to make sure it's not going to fall off. And then when you set your iris, you're just doing it with this. And you're setting your focus here. If you're using a focus motor, like today we're using a Nucleus M, that would just line up on here, just like that. So maybe that'll save you guys a little bit of embarrassment or stressing out if you don't know how to put an anamorphic lens on to a PL mount. One thing I like to do before I start the interview is on all the cameras, I'll call it the setting. So, Hey guys, we're at 5600 white balance, ND4 stops, ISO 800, you know, whatever. Literally call all the settings and match them across all the cameras if you're within the same ecosystem. So if, typically for me, I'm shooting the C500, the C70s, they all match, I know that. So I can match settings across the cameras and it's gonna make it easier in the edit to match all the looks. And then another thing I'll do is before we start rolling, when you start the interview, that's kind of when you start to build the rapport with your subject, you start to get the, inter the interview subject really comfortable. What I like to do before we ever call action is I'll check, make sure I got plenty of space in my memory card, and make sure I got a full battery. Because once you start, you don't really want to break the flow and have to go like, hey, oh, real quick, I got to change a battery. And maybe your subject was getting real emotional or something like that. So it's nice if you can make sure you're dialed and you can record for like maybe at least an hour. You know, you've got plenty of battery and plenty of media. So that's what I like to do before I start the interview. So one of the things when I'm running an interview, I like to sit on the same height stool as my subject. That way you can basically get the same eye line. So Tyler, if I were to, you can, I'm recording right now, so watch, I see this. If you were to make eye contact with me right here, notice how the eye line looks kind of weird. It looks like he's looking down. I'll turn to him if I were to just kind of stand up and you're looking at me right here. It looks like you're kind of looking up, which is sort of a, it's an awkward look. And I'm gonna put the screen over right here, so we'll see what's going on. But now if I sort of match his height, I come right here. It gets real conversational. So it matches the eye line, which looks good. And it looks like a natural way to look like you're having a conversation. So it feels better already. So generally speaking, it's going to allow them to kind of relax into position. Uh, another thing I like to do is if you don't have another camera operator, like if you're shooting an interview by yourself, and say you're operating a camera, you can put like a piece of tape on the wall or something like that. And you can say, hey, I know it might seem a little funny, but you can just help me out for this. You can put a piece of tape on the wall and you can say, when you're giving your answers, you could just look at that piece of tape. That's kind of a way to do it if you're solo operating for an interview. So what I like to do when I'm running an interview is I'll have my questions prepared ahead of time. That way, you don't really have to stress out about like, okay, what am I going to talk to this person about? You're kind of getting nervous because like, oh shoot, like I already asked them a few questions and like can't really think of anything else now. And you also kind of want to know what you're looking for in the edit. And you want to lead your subject to say, in their own words, what you're looking for. You, you need to know what you want out of it. Otherwise, you're just going to wind up with like hours of footage, and you're going to have to try to figure it out in the edit. You're going to realize, oh man, they never talked about that really cool part in their story. So what I like to do, if I already know my subject and I know what story I'm looking for, I'll make some bullet points of key things that I really want to hit in the interview, and I'll try to lead them with some questions. Like I might say, uh, tell me about a time when you were young and there was something really tough that happened. And I already kind of know what the thing is that I might be looking for. So I'll try to lead them to a question. And don't feel afraid to suggest ways they might say it. If you're looking for something more condensed or a little shorter, you could say, hey, that was great. 
can we try a version where you say that whole thing in one sentence? And it'll help you kind of speed things up in your edit instead of having to always chop out words and reformulate sentences that they never really said. So another thing you want to do with your subject, don't cut cameras unless you're done with the interview, basically. Like, if your subject might be getting emotional or something like that, keep the cameras rolling. And you don't want to give your subject affirmations. Like, if you say, hey, tell me about a time, you know, of something tragic that happened when you were growing up, or whatever the thing might be. As they're saying the answer, you don't want to go, right, wow, oh my gosh, that's crazy, no way. You don't want to be saying that, it's going to ruin your audio. And it, it's, it sounds amateur, but if you think about it in a conversation, anytime you're talking to a friend or something like that, you're always sort of like going, oh wow, dang, oh man, really? Whoa. And it's going to ruin your audio if you do that for obvious reasons. So you want to be quiet and even give yourself five seconds when they complete talking. You don't want to jump right in and start saying something else. So they finish saying their thing and you're like, wow, hey, that was so good. Give a few seconds and it's going to give you a chance if you want a chance in the edit to extend a pause out and then cut, but you still want that room tone, you won't have to make some awkward jump cut there. I like to remind the person who's being interviewed to give context to their questions. If you ask a question and you say, tell me about the hardest thing that ever happened to you as a child, and they say, losing a parent. What you'd actually see in the edit would just be losing a parent, and there's no context to the question. Before the interview starts, I'll ask them to answer everything in complete sentences. So instead of saying, losing a parent, they might say, the hardest thing that ever happened to me as a child was when I lost my father. And not to talk about a dark subject, but um, you know, if, if you're talking about something, you want to give a complete context of what you're talking about instead of just saying just the answer, where it's like two or three words. So that's kind of a nice way when you get to the edit, when you're actually cutting out the part where you're asking the question, the viewer is still going to understand what's being asked. All right, guys, so we're actually on a real set today. We just finished filming interviews literally all day long. That's kind of why I thought, hey, let's make this video on filming interviews. But one of the cool things is this is like a bonus tip, and you definitely don't need all this gear right when you start. But one nice thing if you have your client on set is if you can have a client monitor um, it has all the feeds of the camera. So this is our A camera, B camera, and then we already unloaded the C camera. But if you can have all your feeds where your client can see and give any feedback they might have, and also if you have a hair and makeup artist on set, or if you have anybody else that might be someone who's giving input, it's really nice if they can all see the images of the camera, and then it prevents people from like, sort of like, you know, like trying to be all up in your business when you're just trying to off your camera. So I like to have a separate monitor for them, and maybe your hair and makeup person might say, oh hey, um, you know, I'm noticing that there's a hair that's a flyaway or whatever. Or maybe the client might say, hey, you're showing a logo of one of our competitors or something like that. So that's one nice thing. Um, this one's already off. Like I said, we already wrapped, but I'll put some B-roll of what it looks like when the, the feed is up. And you can see in real time what the cameras are capturing. So it's a nice little bonus tip. You know, once you kind of eventually build up your gear and you've kind of got all your main stuff, investing in some client monitors is actually a pretty nice thing. All right, guys, thanks for sticking around for this video. Hopefully you got something out of it. If you like this kind of content, consider hitting that subscribe button, and I'll see you in the next one. Take care.